Get Rich Education is brought to you by Norada Real Estate Corporate Direct and Ridge Lending Group. Cashflow real estate investors, this is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Did you know that you can finance up to 35 income properties all with one lender? Ridge Lending Group specializes in investment property loans, and they do it in almost every U.S. state. Ridge has worked with tens of thousands of real estate investors and homeowners all over the country. They've been doing this for investors for so long that at this point, they've helped more families realize their dreams of becoming real estate investors than any other mortgage lender in the country. To find out more, visit RidgeLendingGroup.com. Welcome to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold giving you information and ideas on the investment that has turned more ordinary people into millionaires and billionaires than anything else and can provide you with more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, and educator, Keith Weinhold. You are inside Get Rich Education, episode 108. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Today, we're talking about your primary residence. Should you pay rent to a landlord in the home that you live in, or should you buy the home that you live in? And I've got a ton of energy on this topic. We also have a guest today to provide his thoughts on this. If the home that you consider living in is going to cost you less than $250,000, then you should buy it. If it costs more than $250,000, you should be a renter. If the home that you want has a rent to value ratio of under seven tenths of 1%, you should rent it. If the RV ratio is over seven tenths of 1%, then you should buy it and own it. Well, now that I made things that clear cut and simple, there surely are a number of it depends factors. And around those numbers, namely, are things like what region of the country do you live in? And really a bunch of touchy-feely things. And touchy-feely things, you know, they have nothing to do with income property, which is what we usually talk about here, but they do come into play with your own home. And that's what we're talking about today. Recently, some well-known authors let their opinions be known. James Altucher, he's talked about how he refuses to buy a house. This year, Grant Cardone published a piece called Buying a House is for Suckers, so those guys do not favor home ownership. Now, 20 years ago, Robert Kiyosaki famously wrote that your house is not an asset. He was talking about how it's not a financial asset because a house takes money out of your pocket every month. A financial asset instead puts money into your pocket every month. But though a home is not a financial asset, It can be a lifestyle asset, and it's just really hard to put a price or a number on that. You really have four options when it comes to your primary residence. Number one, you can buy a home. Number two, you can rent a home. Number three, you can be homeless. Or number four, you can live with your parents, okay? But we're really just focused on the first two. Should you rent or buy your home? Now, if you own your home, you might qualify for lower insurance rates or better credit cards. If you live in an area where there are frequent earthquakes or hurricanes, that's something that trends toward you wanting to be a renter, of course. Homeowners with loans get the financial benefit of leverage, which renters don't. We're going to meet our next guest, and after he and I chat, I'm going to come back at the end of the show, and I'm going to tell you how much the home that my wife and I live in is worth and whether I chose to rent or buy and why. Kirk Chisholm is a financial planner based in Lexington, Massachusetts. That's near Boston. And can you believe that I would actually have a financial planner on the show? But Kirk is different, as you're going to see. He's not a traditional broker dealer. His firm is into alternative investments, transparency, and risk management. Let's meet him. Today's guest is a wealth manager and principal at Innovative Advisory Group. And they're not just another investment advisory firm. I mean, in my opinion, they're not one of these firms that just necessarily thinks you should be well diversified in a portfolio of stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, which, as we know over time, 
really doesn't beat inflation, taxes, fees, and that emotional predisposition to buy and sell at the wrong time. Innovative, they have this awareness of alternative investments. For example, they even published something really valuable called a monthly inflation monitor. So I'm really impressed. You know, you wouldn't usually think I would bring a financial firm on this show, but it's just not a business as usual place. So Innovative Advisory Group got my attention long ago for reasons like that. I want to welcome Principal of Innovative Advisory Group, Kirk Chisholm. Great. How's it going? Thanks for having me on, Keith. Hey, it's great to have you here. So, you know, Kirk, some people think that buying a home to live in themselves, once they can afford to do it, like they've made something of themselves, like that's a good financial investment. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it's an interesting question. About a year ago, I had a client come to me and ask me to do an analysis on them buying a home. Going through that analysis, we analyzed whether it made sense to rent or buy and came up with some shocking conclusions, things that I would never have thought. I think most of what we do is is dispelling uh, typical myths or financial myths, but this one was actually shocking to me and realized through that analysis that actually it ended up being a lot cheaper to rent, which is surprising because most people think that, oh, you have to own a home. It, it's the best investment. And, you know, through our research, you realize that the the uh, campaign for home ownership or the American dream was started by Fannie Mae of all uh, companies. So go figure. <laughs> Going through that process, we realize that there are a number of factors that go into into whether it makes sense to to rent or own. And some of those factors are not financial. So they're more of the touchy feely factors of the feeling of home ownership or being able to do what you want with the house. I mean, those are things that you can't really put a number on. But most of the other aspects are actually almost entirely financial. And I think when it comes to analyzing that comparison, it really ends up being much more straightforward. Things like whether you have to uh, pay for rent versus a mortgage, other costs that you don't have to pay as a renter, like taxes or in many cases, water, sewage, things like that. So there's there's a number of factors that, that come into play with the comparison, but things like mobility, maintenance costs, down payment, capital appreciation, all these things come into play. And I think that when homeowners are looking to move, either rent or buy, they have to analyze all these different aspects to find out whether it makes the most sense for them to rent or buy and not just make an assumption that a home is an investment because it's not. A home is an expense. I think a lot of people feel that you have to own a home because it's an investment and it goes up in value. And when you actually run the numbers, it's not as much of an investment as you think in general. The investment aspect, if you consider it this way, whether you're renting or owning, you're paying to live somewhere. The costs are non-negotiable. Unless you're living in a tent, you pretty much have to live somewhere. And you have to pay for those costs. If you're renting, you're paying a landlord. If you're owning, you're paying yourself. But you're not necessarily paying yourself as an investment. You're paying yourself in order to pay the costs of owning the home. So the mortgage, taxes, things like that. If you buy a piece of property and rent it out, that is an investment. Owning a home yourself is not an investment necessarily. Or if it is an investment, it might be a bad investment (laughs) because financially it just doesn't catch up with someone. I think it may just may be a good lifestyle investment, but typically it just does not work out as a financial investment. Now, real estate agents, they love to launch these marketing campaigns, you know, often that come around one six word sentence. Why throw away money on rent? Why throw away money on rent? But you're not necessarily doing that. Like you mentioned, Kurt, you have to pay something to live somewhere. And you might actually be paying more effectively and be getting further behind. And this is just a maybe when you go ahead and own your own home. And there's this other thing about, you know, a renting stigma. And I sort of think that we're getting away from this. But a renting stigma is still pretty pervasive today. Like someone should be a little bit embarrassed to say that they rent rather than own, but renting might actually be the smarter thing. And I think part of the conventional wisdom, it's not just the potential appreciation component of real estate when you own your own home. It's also that uh, premise that a person says, well, you're not building equity 
if you're just throwing rent away. You know, if you own your own home, at least you're building some equity. But there are some problems with that, too. You know, so tell us a little bit about that. So when we analyze the different aspects of the renting versus buying, we started to look at equity because obviously if you rent, you don't have to usually put down more than one or two months deposit or, you know, cleaning deposit or things like that, the first and last. But typically when you're buying a home, you put down around 20%, which is a huge chunk of change for most people. When analyzing, you think about the difference. If you're buying, let's say, a $100,000 property, you're putting down 20000 Well, is that 20000 growing at a rate commensurate with other investments? So if you took that 20000 I know this is next to impossible in this type of environment, but let's say it's 5%, hypothetically, and you're growing that money at 5% a year, and you compare that with the money that's sitting in your house, is it growing at a similar rate? Now, historically, up until, I believe, right around 2000, right around 97, I think it was, that real estate was actually highly correlated with the rate of inflation. I mean, it's almost identical. And then 2000 to recently, it's kind of gone off the charts. But historically, for other countries as well, it, it typically coincides with the rate of inflation. So as long as we have inflation, then real estate values should go up. But there's certainly no guarantee of that. Historically, going back 60 years, you can say, well, we've always had inflation, but we, we've not always had inflation. It's only been in the last 60 some odd years. And I think that aspect is an important consideration in the mix. But, you know, going back to your, your earlier point, I listened to your show on Robert Kiyosaki, which was great. And he made the point of brokers are usually broker than you, right. which I, I, I love that line. It's great. When they're trying to convince you that you need to buy versus rent, well, look at their compensation. They make 6% off of the value of your home if you buy, and they make maybe one month's rent off of you know what you're renting it for. There's a huge discrepancy in their compensation. So obviously, they're, they're trying to make money, but I, I think that it's, it's not just them. It's pervasive throughout our society that people believe that you need to own a home to show that you're successful, that successful people own real estate. And that's true. Successful people own investment real estate. Right. That's very true. But when it comes to owning a home, I think a lot of people are stuck in this mentality of home ownership. It's the American dream. It's what you aspire to. And, you know, I know that the the, two, the early 2000s didn't do much to dispel that because it was a huge campaign put on to promote buying real estate. And of course, you know, we saw what happened during that time. But I think there's nothing wrong with owning a home. People have to decide for themselves what makes the most sense. And what I think is the important consideration is that people actually have to do the calculations. I've done the calculations in the Northeast here and looked at a lot of different comparisons. And I've seen the discrepancies of the high end homes being much, much in the favor of the renter, where the renter makes a, a, a huge margin of difference over the homeowner. As I said earlier, sometimes it has absolutely nothing to do with numbers. It might be a break even. And what's most important to your husband or wife is that you own the home because you can do whatever you want to it and you, you feel like it. You, you have this sense of it's home and you can stay there forever. And for some people, that's invaluable. So you can't put a number on that. But getting back to the point, it, it's really what makes the most sense is that people are actually thinking about this and, and thinking about the different aspects and what is important to them. So it's not just a flat out decision of, oh, I have to buy because my friends did, or people will think that I'm a failure because I'm renting versus owning. You just can't think of it that way. I can't remember the last time where I was invited over to my kid's parents' house and I said, oh, do you own this home? <laughs> so I, I don't think everybody needs to know, but it, it's certainly uh, a consideration for some people. Yeah, it is. And it necessarily shouldn't be. There shouldn't be any stigma attached to that. I mean, someone is often, especially if they live in a coastal area, a lot savvier if they rent a higher priced home that they live in and they rent out sort of lower priced homes in the Midwest and South to others. I think that's really smart investing in real estate. And the word investing 
and your own primary residence, they just don't so much go together. And part of what the industry tells us, and yes, okay, Fannie Mae, sure, they are the one credited, whether they said it or not, they are the one often cited in kind of perpetuating this whole homeownership is the American dream and getting those things associated with each other. But I think most real estate agents, even if they were truly interested in their client, I don't even think that they know the best questions that the prospective homeowner ought to be asking that real estate agent. And the real estate agent doesn't really have that information either because the real estate agent doesn't think like an investor. They just want to close a sale. Okay. So a real estate agent, they're not even thinking about things like the return from home equity is absolutely zero. Presence or absence of equity in a home has absolutely nothing to do with whether it goes up in value or whether it goes down in value. That's based on external things, in-migration, out-migration, supply, demand, and a whole lot of other things. But when it comes to appreciation and building equity in a place, that might still give that prospective homeowner leverage. And that homeowner doesn't even know what leverage really means. But in an appreciating environment, they will have the advantage of leverage but they might be putting so much of their monthly income into a home payment that it might make them cash flow negative or cash flow thin such that, you know, they're really living a degraded quality of life and they can't get out and do some of the things that they want to do because a lot of money that they've put into the home, yes, they are building equity, but that money also is not very liquid. So every month that homeowner goes ahead and takes money from their liquidity pocket and transfers over onto the other pocket of their pants into like an illiquid dollar. So there are really just so many considerations when you consider the return from equity itself is nothing. You do have leverage, and you're really converting liquid dollars into non-liquid dollars. So there's just so much to consider around that that most people aren't thinking of, and they don't know to think about. And there are just an awful lot of costs of home ownership that one is not thinking about when they're a homeowner rather than being a renter. Okay, so you've got these sunk costs of home ownership, like closing costs, significant closing costs that are often 4% of the purchase price of a home. They're just sunk. They're just gone. Those maintenance costs, those repair costs, maybe even some landscaping costs, they're all costs born on you now where they weren't if you were a renter. And they're typically more than what you imagine. Now, some agents might even try to sell homeowners on the fact that, well, you have great tax advantages. You have the mortgage interest deduction. But, you know, just like with most investments, you don't want to let the tax tail wag the dog. That's just one other small thing to consider. What do you think about some of those things, Kirk? Well, I think what's what's interesting is when we when we ran started running the numbers, we realized that most people are using their calculations are using very simple measures. They're looking at Taxes, mortgage, and insurance is typically what they say you should calculate in figuring out the cost of your home. But there's so much more than that, as you briefly stated. I mean, things like snow removal, repairs, renovations, landscaping, a really expensive item, which actually my wife uh, reminded me of, is when you buy a new home, you have to furnish it. <laughs> and that actually is a lot higher number than I think most people realize. And you know, I, I know a lot of people who move into larger houses and it takes them up to a year to furnish it, but that is a huge cost if you're upsizing. And I, I think a lot of people miss that expense. Even beyond that, there are things like maintenance costs or the lifespan of appliances. And I think if you can look out, let's say, put a, a time horizon of expenses out 20 years to see what you're going to be spending it on, probably be shocked at your at your expenses. So, you know, you can look at things like taxes, which may be between one or two percent, depending on where you live. I'm sure some places like maybe Alaska probably has cheaper taxes than uh, Massachusetts. But, you know, I think that even using like to say like a one and a half percent tax rate, you can look at maybe one percent for maintenance costs. And these are things that you don't plan for or you can plan for them. But, you know, a lot of things that most people don't. So you could use probably like a 1% number to estimate that so you don't have to figure every detail out because some people aren't as detail-oriented. So it's a, usually kind of a safe assumption there. Those costs add up, and, and I think if, if people really kind of ran through those and realized that uh, many of those you don't actually have to pay as a renter. So you've got this huge hidden cost that people aren't analyzing, and then they end up 
already stretched because they're house poor. You know, they try to extend to be successful and keep up with the Joneses. And it's just hard to do because even the Joneses are trying to keep up with the Joneses. They're, <laughs> they're also house poor. And you don't know because they're not going to tell you about it. So you've got this social system where people are trying to one up each other. And at the core, they're not really as stable as maybe they were decades ago before people started using a lot more leverage and debt in their lives. But I think one of the, the things that is surprising to most people is the impact of inflation. And right now we have very, very low inflation. But most people put down 20%, let's say, hypothetically, for their, for their home when they buy it. And, I mean, you're effectively, you've got a, a five-to-one leverage. So effectively, if your house goes up 2%, 2% value, you made 10% on your money. Right which is great. However, I think over the 60 so on year period that we've experienced, people naturally assume that's that's going to always happen. Just like real estate always goes up in value. That assumption didn't work out for people and in many cases that's one of the causes of the housing crisis is people weren't planning on that change. They just assumed it didn't think through the risks if things changed. Yeah, we're talking about potentially hidden costs for homeowners, one of those being inflation versus deflation, and the other is really just the obsolescence of items in a home. Inflation is something that's going to prop up and help over time the homeowner or the real estate investor that has a lot of loans, whereas on the contrary, deflation would crush them. And the other thing is the obsolescence of items in a home, and a lot of people just don't think about that. If you live in a home for seven years, And um, after seven years, you might notice the same appliances that you had on the day you moved in are starting to look a little bit old. Or the paint on the outside of the home, hmm, that's starting to look a little bit old and faded. Well, if you were renting that home during the entire seven years, all you do is move out and you move into a place where it's just all turnkey done for you. Pick a place that has nice appliances. Pick a place that has a fresh new cone of paint. And if you're the homeowner, you are born with all those costs, both financially and time-wise, You're listening to Get Rich Education. Our guest is Innovative Advisory Group's Kirk Chisholm. More when we come back. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Are you having a hard time finding great investment properties? Unfortunately, the best deals are rarely found locally. Successful investing begins with the right properties in the right markets. Norada Real Estate provides everything you need to invest in the best deals across the U.S. Our simple, proven system will help you create real wealth and passive monthly cash flow. Get your free copy of the ultimate guide to passive real estate investing at noradarealestate.com slash guide. That's N-O-R-A-D-A realestate.com slash guide. You've worked hard to acquire real estate. Don't lose it in a blue instant. We live in a litigious society. Assets must be protected. Rich Dad advisor Garrett Sutton founded Corporate Direct to provide strong and effective asset protection for all investors in America. Corporate Direct offers personalized attention to your specific situation and is very affordable. Call 800-600-1760 and mention Get Rich Education for a $100 discount on all formations. Garrett Sutton wrote Loopholes of Real Estate, Start Your Own Corporation, and Toxic Client, among other bestsellers. He and his experienced team at Corporate Direct want you to be protected right now and with proper corporate maintenance into the future. Visit CorporateDirect.com today for a free incorporation kit or call 800-600-1760 for your Get Rich discount. That's CorporateDirect.com at 800-600-1760. This is the Real Wealth Network's Kathy Fetke, and you are listening to the always valuable Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Welcome back to Get Rich Education with our guest, Innovative Advisory Group's Kirk Chisholm, InnovativeWealth.com. Kirk, you have three methods that you use to help one determine the rent versus buy decision. Tell us about that. Thanks, Keith. Yeah. So when I did some analysis for a client on the rent versus buy, I looked at it from many different angles because there's one angle, which is strictly numbers. Then there's another angle, which is monthly cash flow. And, you know, there's also highest and best use. So the the methods I use, the first one is the cash flow method. So this is how much money you spend out of your pocket in cash each month. This is the most visible method. That's the one that probably the majority of people are actually using because it's just what they see on a month-to-month basis. I mean, if you've seen some recent studies, 
they've shown that right around 70% of the people have like $1,000 or less in their bank account. So most people are living month to month. But, you know, the cash flow method is, is probably the most popular from that perspective. They're looking to see how much can I afford to pay. And the second method, which I call like the net expense method, which is how much of the expenses are you actually paying out? So you're paying a mortgage, you're paying principal and interest. So you're effectively paying the interest out because the principal you're paying back to yourself. You're not paying anybody right. to pay the principal. So effectively, we remove the principal payments from the calculations. You can say, here's what you're actually spending to somebody else. This would be a little bit better equivalent than to the renter because you're paying out rent and the expenses of living there. This would equate to that a little bit better because actually it's what your expenses are. And the third one, which I call like highest and best use method, this is where you're looking at the amount of money in the principal balance as well. So if you're putting down 20% of a $100,000 property, it's 20000 How much is that going to appreciate over time, over 20 years? Is it going to appreciate 2%, 5%? Depending on which part of the country you live in, that would vary. I mean, I'm in the Northeast, so the appreciations are a little bit lower than in some other areas. They're more consistent. So what I look at is is highest and best use. So in one example, you would put down 20% or 20000 on a house. On example number two, you would put down 20000 into a CD or the stock market or maybe another piece of investment property or something that is going to have a gain of, let's say, 2 or 5% or whatever number you want to use. But you're looking at where is this capital going to grow the most? So in a normal functioning environment, which we haven't had for many, many years, you would see some consistency in the cycles. So real estate has up and down cycles. Stock market has up and down cycles. Most assets go through those cycles because markets are typically cyclical. So looking at that, you can maybe devise what's the best use of my money right now. Maybe real estate's cheap right now, or maybe it's expensive, but either way, you're looking at where is this 20,000 going that is going to get the highest and best use and make the most returns because otherwise it's sitting in your house. So we look at all three when we're analyzing the the rent versus buy because you really have to look at it from different perspectives so you fully understand what the differences are in this rent versus buy model. And I think that's that's a really important way to to look at it. And there are other ways to look at it. Those, Those are the three that I've chosen to use. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of times people just don't even consider that simple opportunity cost of having 20K tied up in a property that's illiquid and what sort of return that that could have earned elsewhere. And that's not the entire story. That's just one thing to consider in the rent versus buy choice. One other thing to consider is what do you think, Kirk? When a person wants to go out and look at homes to buy or look at homes to rent, you know, especially if they want to get a, a moderate to a nicer place, you probably have more choices when you go to buy a home than when you go to look at one to rent. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great point, Keith, because when people are looking to rent, there are certain neighborhoods or I guess you could say demographics, part of your location that are more suitable to renting versus owning. But typically, for instance, like a college campus community, there's probably a lot of rentals in that area. Or maybe downtown in the city, there's probably a lot more renters than owners just by nature of of the location. But more often than not, if you're looking to buy a house, there are probably a lot more houses for sale than there are for rent. And as, as you get into the higher end homes, that's even more accentuated because, I mean, you think about it, how many People who, let's say, are worth $10 million want to rent a home. Most of them are going to buy a home just because they have the money. So you don't have as many renters in that high end of the market, and you have fewer people looking to rent out their house because maybe it's a really nice house and they don't want a renter to ruin it or whatever their their mindset is. So you don't tend to see as many, but I find that the ones that are up there are very, very reasonable when it comes to the cause. I remember working with a broker for one of my clients. I was on a call with them and saying, you know, what's the deal with the house? Can we get this for a longer time period? And the broker said, you can have as long as you want. <laughs> like this lady, 
she owns the house free and clear. She doesn't, she just wants somebody in there to get rental income. She's like, you can stay there as long as you want. We really don't care. We're not looking to use the house. We're not looking to sell it. We just want to keep it for the family. So you can generally be more creative on the higher end as well because there are fewer people looking to rent it and, and fewer people looking to, to rent it out. Yeah, you're right. You bring up a good point. To that person that might be wealthy but might own a nice home that's vacant, maybe they're not very aware and or concerned about making a great return on the property. They already have it paid off. So in their mind, they don't have principal and interest to pay, and they're just happy to get a rent income off it at all. That wealthy person is not thinking about the opportunity cost of having all that money sunk in a home and where else they could put it. And that arbitrage, that actually creates a great deal for a renter. If you can rent a high-end place, and you're probably going to pay in rent a proportionally smaller amount in relation to that high purchase price. So I think you're really making out well that way. It makes a lot of sense in most markets to rent a high-end home. You know, Kirk, on this show, a lot of times we talk about the rent to value ratio. We're real estate investors interested in cash flow. A lot of times it's a 1% rent to value ratio that ends up providing cash flow to the investor. So that's if one month's rent is 1% or more of the purchase price, that's probably a pretty good deal for us as the investor. But is the 1% rent to value ratio really a good deal? Well, in a sense, it depends on who you are. OK, because the one percent rent to value ratio, well, then it, it really makes sense to own. You're probably in one of those parts of the country in the Midwest or South where it makes sense to own because in homes that have a one percent rent to value ratio, that would be, for example, a one thousand dollar monthly rent income on a one hundred thousand dollar property. You know, that person's kind of paying high rent in proportion to a low purchase price. That's why it makes sense for us in, as an investor. Now, in places like San Francisco or Manhattan, that rent-to-value ratio might only be three-tenths of 1%. So in that case, that renter is paying a low rent in proportion to a much higher purchase price. They're getting great amenities for a relatively low monthly expense to them. Well, I think it's interesting. It's a, it's a good point you raised because closer to the coasts, in the West and East Coast, there tend to be bigger discrepancies than, you say, in the in the heartland, the middle of the country. Yeah. Truly actually had a good infographic about a year ago where you could actually adjust some different figures and it would show you whether it made more sense to rent or to own. Uh, this is year old, so it's probably still valid, but, you know, obviously with some changes. But if you look at places like New York, it looks like it, it's, according to what it says, it's 25 percent more expensive to buy. In Boston, where I'm from, it's 10% more expensive to buy. San Francisco's 26 and LA's 23. And so if you look at the middle of the country, it's actually like, say, Kansas City, Missouri, it's 21% cheaper to buy. So obviously with real estate, it's location, location, location. But I think that if you're actually considering the rent versus buy, it's very subject to where you live and the location. And I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. With this client that I was working with, one of the houses we looked at, it was for $1.4 million, and the owner had it for sale and for rent on MLS. It was for sale for one4 and it was for rent for 4000 a month. What a deal. Uh, and for the renter. I, yes. I called him up and said, can I rent this for 30 years? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. That's, that's absurd. It's crazy. It was like a, the total cost for a third of the cost of buying it. And you could say, well, that was probably a one-off thing, but it wasn't. I realized at the time there were five other high-end homes that were exactly the same. They were at such a discrepancy of the rent versus buy. I was shocked. Yeah, well, you just gave a great example right there, Kirk. Paying $4,000 in monthly rent for a $1.4 million property, that is like a little bit less than a three-tenths of 1% rent-to-value ratio. And again, the question being, is, is that a good deal? And the answer is, it depends on who you are. If you're a renter, it's a great deal. If you're an owner, it's awful. Because if you have $1.4 billion worth of property as a real estate investor, where you're renting property to others, that should generate $14,000 of rent income, not $4,000. So that's kind of arbitrage that's really being exploited there. And we've talked a lot about numbers here, Kirk. And, you know, there are a few other touchy-feely things, too, that are going on. For one thing, I find it interesting that we do have the lowest home ownership rate 
in more than 50 years, even though at the same time we have low mortgage interest rates. Now, if someone would look at mortgage interest rates and they didn't know what the home ownership rate was, they think that the home ownership rate might be higher because people are taking advantage of low mortgage interest rates, but instead, just the opposite thing is going on. There are a lot of reasons for that. A person can be a lot more mobile when they rent rather than buy. And now we have the largest generation, Kirk, the millennials, the largest generation, larger than the baby boomers. And millennials, you know what? They saw what happened to their parents during that millennials formative years. They saw their parents often lose their home in foreclosure or be underwater on a home that made their parents immobile and they couldn't move. So you kind of have this partially psychologically rendered, partially demographically rendered phenomenon that there are actually more renters today, even though we have low mortgage interest rate. Well, Kirk, any final thoughts on renting versus buying a home? People have to consider that there is a strong psychology of renting versus owning, and I don't think that should be dismissed. My business is centered around investments and finance, but I think the the kind of the touchy-feely aspect of the psychology of renting versus owning is very important that people shouldn't overlook because If you have a husband and wife or wife that has an attachment to a property, you probably know they want a home because it looks beautiful and it smells like chocolate chip cookies when they walk in or or whatever the appeal is. That is important. You can't dismiss that. (laughs) They probably get angry if you do. So that's an important part of the process of the psychology of owning, but also the psychology of moving or selling. I mean, if you rent, You could potentially have to move out if you don't negotiate yourself a pretty good lease. You might have to move out because the landlord wants to raise rent or they want to sell their property or convert it into condos or whatever it might be. And moving has a a psychological tax attached to it. It's not monetary, but I mean, let's be honest. Who really wants to move? (laughs) It's such a pain in the butt. You got to hire movers. They break your stuff. You got to buy new stuff. The process is not fun. I, I... Maybe in my younger years, I enjoyed it more, but I certainly don't look forward to moving nowadays. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Experts do say it's one of the most psychologically traumatic things you can go through. It's right up there with divorce. And yeah, I think the only people that move are ones that have forgotten how bad their last move was. There's just been enough passage of time where they don't really remember everything that they had to go through. Well, Kirk, Innovative Wealth got my attention quite a while ago because you don't just do business as usual over there. Tell us a little bit more about your company. Sure. Thanks, Keith. So Innovative Advisor Group really grew out of the idea that we wanted to be able to offer clients the entire gamut of investment possibilities. So I spent my prior years at some of the larger broker dealers and quickly realized that there are a lot of investments out there that made sense for people to consider, like real estate, for instance, or tax liens or gold or horses or whatever it might be that people can invest in that we weren't allowed to work with our clients on. So we created Innovative Advisor Group, my partner and I, to offer alternative investments and additionally to offer them inside of retirement accounts. So if people wanted to buy real estate in their IRA or buy a privately held company inside of their retirement account. That's the type of thing that we wanted to offer. So when I was, I would say maybe over 10 years ago, we do a lot of internal research. And one of the research studies we did was on correlations. People talk about diversification is a good risk management tool. But we did a lot of work on that and realized that you can put a diversified portfolio together in the market and it only works in good times. When markets are turned bad, like 2008, Everything correlates. So it doesn't matter what you're invested in. You're most likely going to get the same return for most of those investments. I think in 2008, the only things were positive were cash, some treasury bonds and gold. Everything else was down 38 percent, give or take a little bit. And that's not proper diversification. You can't do that. So when we started to explore beyond that, we looked at other alternatives that made sense for our clients and realized that the only real way to get a diversified portfolio is to look for truly low correlation assets, many of which are not publicly traded. So that's really kind of the genesis of our firm. We're a fee-only advisory firm, so we don't get paid commissions. We're, the only way we get paid is actually directly through the client, and we are fiduciaries, which is an extremely high level of care, which means that we have to prioritize our clients over our own interests. We like to get outside the box and 
to think differently because I find that it helps people to kind of understand the world better. You're not a traditional brokerage. You're informing people about self-directed IRAs. You're informing people with your inflation monitor. Kirk, over the break, you let me know that you had something, a resource for Get Rich Education listeners. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, I put together a special gift for the uh, Get Rich Education audience. I actually, in one of the blog posts that we referenced in this talk, it had a, a calculator that we put together, the rent versus buy calculator with the three different methods that I use. So as kind of a, a bonus gift, I've put that together and I've offered that Excel uh, calculator for, for your listeners. You can find that rent versus buy calculator at innovativewealth.com slash GRE. Populate that calculator to help you make a rent versus buy decision. Kirk Chisholm, thanks so much for coming on to Get Rich Education. Great. Well, thanks for having me on, Keith. Kirk and I had some other discussion. He does not see mortgage interest rates going as high as 6% even in the next 10 years. He thinks that if they went to 6% right now, our country would implode. And I'm in agreement that we could not handle 6% right now. I think you know from listening to me before that my wife and I own our home. Our home is worth $470,000. It would rent for $2,800. Well, that right there, that's only a rent-to-value ratio of six-tenths of 1%. And I said at the top of the show that if it's under seven-tenths, then that trends toward renting, not owning. Plus, I live in an area of frequent earthquakes, so then why do we own? Well, for one thing, I'm not as financially precarious, maybe, as some people. I've also found a clever way to use a conventional loan to put 5% down when I purchase this home. There's no PMI payment, and I still get a great 3.5% 30-year fixed rate. I've told you in prior shows how I did that. So therefore, I have less equity tied up in a home, 5% rather than 20%, which is what most people do. Another consideration is no one can tell me to move. I just really wouldn't want that mental pollution of knowing that someone could tell me to move. Another thing is that I guess I just like things nicer than most people. For example, this past summer, I paid $900 to have our driveway resealed. Well, there were some little cracks in it, but it didn't really need to be resealed that badly. But it was gray. Well, I didn't want my driveway to be looking so dull and gray. I wanted it black. So I like things nice. But had I been renting a place from a person, it would just be ridiculous for me to ask my landlord to go ahead and have sealed the driveway. So I just kind of like stuff nicer. And you know what else? I would consider doing a sale lease back of my home if I knew that I could trust a landlord to never tell me to move. So that means I'd change from being a homeowner to a renter, and yet I wouldn't have to move. Something else I'd like you to consider is that if you have decided that you want to buy rather than rent your primary residence, be the second owner of a home. Don't buy new construction and don't buy something too old. In fact, I've lived in three different single-family homes in my life, and each time I've been the second owner of the home. Yeah, be the second owner. You're typically going to get new amenities and a modern layout, and yet see the first owner of the home that bought it new construction, they were the ones that got eaten up and beaten up with more of those costs that end up being greater than you think, like landscaping and window treatments and a lot of those things that the builder really didn't leave for you in the condition that you want. And, you know, that stuff can easily run you $10,000 to $30,000 or even more. And you have the benefit of those items without having to pay for them with your time or money when you're the second owner of a home. So rather than buy new construction, when you're the second owner, you also get to see, well, what kind of neighbors and what kind of construction filled in around you. If you own a new construction home, you know, you find things like, oh, the foundation is still settling and you can get pretty concerned with some things like, well, just how bad are those settlement cracks in the walls going to get, okay? Be the second owner of a home and you'll just have a lot more certainty about some things. So with this whole rent versus buy, in conclusion and in general, if you live in an area of low home prices like the Midwest and South, which are what I like to call the stable markets, own. If you live in an area of high home prices like the coasts, then be a renter. I know a lot of successful real estate investors that do just this because they know how to run the numbers. Successful real estate investors, savvy financial people, they're often a renter in the high-end home that they live in, 
And then they buy tons of lower priced homes and rent those out to others. That's the formula right there. Most people don't know how to run the numbers. Kirk's calculator can help you do that. The link to that gift is in the show notes. I hope that I delivered for you today. I really want every last episode to create more value for you than the time that you have invested listening. So hopefully today was the best, basically the best audio library resource that you've ever heard on renting versus buying your home. I'd really appreciate it if you tell a friend or a family member or a coworker about the show. I put out a new show like this every Friday for over two years, and I'll be back talking about turnkey real estate investing with you next week. If you want to make your education actionable, get our free newsletter at GetRichEducation.com. Until next week, we've got a big election between now and then, so I hope that you vote your conscience. And there's just one other thing. Don't quit your daydream. You've been listening to Get Rich Education, telling you what the wealthy won't tell you about real estate and investing. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. Flow real estate investors nationwide and worldwide. This is Get Rich Education's Keith Weinhold. Forbes has rated Memphis, Tennessee as the number one cash flowing market in the world. Our good friends at Mid South Home Buyers have been Memphis's premier turnkey real estate provider for 14 years with a stellar reputation and an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. Owner Terry Kerr was born and raised in Memphis. Yeah, he knows the market and has renovated and sold over 1,000 houses in the Memphis area. Find out what their many repeat buyers already know. Their houses are completely renovated, even come with a one-year builder's warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're a perfect fit for the first-time out-of-state investor or the seasoned investor diversifying their portfolio. Mid-South Homebuyers Friendly Staff makes investing easy. Learn more at midsouthhomebuyers.com or give them a call at 901-217-HOME. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, getricheducation.com.